title of this talk is called Techno Signatures at High Energies. And today we have Dr. And the abstract, I'm going to read the abstract really. For the first part of this talk, uh, he will identify several constraints to search for techno signatures. He argues that it makes the most sense to look for long lasting high energy and high density living activities. He'll present the worth of the Kardashev and the Boro scale and argue that they can be fruitfully combined. Such a combination suggests a new techno signature marker, a universal complexity metric grounded in thermodynamics, which is energy rate densities. So that sounds really fun. Okay, in the second part of the talk, he'll illustrate his approach with the Stellavore hypothesis some existing binary star systems as type two civilizations on the Kardashev scale. And we'll show that candidates star eating stellivore civilizations have an anomalously high energy rate density. He'll also present the pulsar positioning system, which provides a galactic GPS um, accurate uh, GPS coordinates accurate down to about 100 meters and discuss the implications for SETI and whether or not it could be an instance of galactic wide techno signature. So Dr. Clement Vidal is a philosopher with a and cognitive sciences. He's eager to tackle big questions, bringing together areas of knowledge such as cosmology, physics, astrobiology, complexity science, or evolution theory. Um, let's see, got to admit somebody really fast. Here we go. He's eager to tackle, uh, I just said that, um, he is the co-founder of the Evo Devo Universe community, and in 2014, he authored The Beginning and the End, The Meaning of Life in the Cosmological Perspective. He's known for having introduced astrobiology and the Stellavore hypothesis and studies SETI implications of the existing pulsar positioning system, an accurate galactic GPS. And uh, for more information on Clement, I will um, post his website in the chat. So I'm going to unpin my video here. Let's see here. There we go. So I'm going to mute my mic and Clement, take it away. Great, thank you very much, uh, Julia. So today I want to talk about techno signatures at high energies. And let's start with um, a very fundamental question, which is, where is everybody? And today I'm giving a talk and there is nobody. But we are all behind our screens. And in, it's the same for astrobiologists we are all behind screens of assumptions, expectations, most of which are, can be unconscious. And so that's why in the first part of, of my talk, be, before going to the heart of, of the matter, I want to share some considerations, uh, some epistemological considerations for astrobiology. Then I will uh, propose some universal constraints for the search for um, extraterrestrials. And then uh, I will show two, two applications of this universal constraint with um, the, the, the uh, potential high energy techno signature, which is uh, Stalivor civilizations, and uh, discuss the pulsar positioning system, which might also be a, a high energy techno signature. So the broadest view we can have about um, uh, about the, the general context is uh, the, the centrism, so the, the, cosmo the general cosmological worldview that we have. Uh, of course, we know through the history of science that geocentrism has been refuted, and heliocentrism also, and galactocentrism. So neither the Earth, nor the Sun, nor the galaxy are, are special. But life is still special, it's still central to, to Earth. Mm. And so to refute it, what we need is a biosignature, uh, a sign of um, 
even a primitive life form. But there is another centrism that we will need to, to refute, which I call intelecentrism. And it's the idea of finding extraterrestrials more advanced than us. And I think it's very important to distinguish the two because finding uh, an extraterrestrial bacteria, bacterium uh, has much less of a psychological impact than finding a, an advanced civilization that is maybe two billion years older than us. Uh, why? Because if we find a bacteria, it will reinforce our, our position. We, we, we could uh, uh, say that we, we are still the, the most advanced species in the universe. Uh, whereas if we find an advanced extraterrestrial, then uh, our, our position in the universe is really uh, demoted drastically. And um, so this might be one reason why there is less researcher and resources into technosignatures and biosignature. Well, it's a hypothesis. Mm, for the sake of completion, there is also a, another centrism that might be refuted one day. It's universe centrism. So maybe as many cosmologists speculate, there are other universes. And then it would be the, the kind of ultimate um, shift from, uh, from the center. So what is um, your bias here? I mean, um, how do we interpret uh, a signal that we receive? Well, first, the, the best possible scenario is that we intercept an extraterrestrial signal and we recognize it as such. So it's called a true positive. It's, it's simply very good science. <clears throat> but very good science is also producing uh, true negatives. That is, you, you intercept, uh, I don't know, a UFO or some, a, a human interference, and we are able to say, no, it's not an extraterrestrial. That's, so that's a true negative. It's also good science. But there are two pitfalls that remain. The first are false positives, so when we believe that uh, a signal is, um, is an extraterrestri is, uh, extraterrestrial from an extraterrestrial life where it's not. Um, for a, a historical example, I include the, the, the canals on Mars that were believed to, to be from a civilization from Mars. And um, there are also false negatives. Uh, it's an interesting possibility if we somehow missed uh, ET uh, in our data that it was here and we, we, we missed it. And here's the example I give is a, if the, the Viking mission on, on Mars of the 70s um, did actually detect uh, life on Mars, there are some researchers that, that claim that, um, that there was life on, on Mars that was detected. So they are reinterpreting existing data and essentially arguing that it was a false negative. And of course, we should avoid both false positives and false negatives. But um, <clears throat> there is an interesting asymmetry here because uh, if, we, if we have a false negative, it seems that it's not as grave as making a false positive. Uh, if I say that I have discovered aliens and I'm wrong, that's embarrassing. If I miss something in my data, it's less of a problem. So there is an interesting asymmetry here. And, and um, I suspect we, the reason why most scientists are very skeptic skeptic about the, the subject matter of astrobiology is that is the risk of uh, of committing a false positive. But skeptics also will almost always be right, and you certainly know this quote from Arthur C. Clarke: "Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic." Well. Uh, it's false, obviously, because magic doesn't exist. Uh, so it has been kind of updated by Carl Schroeder, who says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. And this is more embarrassing. What he means is that uh, an advanced civilization or technology will be so efficient, so flowing with nature that we wouldn't be able to recognize it. But it's also always true and trivial because life is made of matter, energy that has to comply with the law of physics, with the law of, of nature, with the laws of nature. 
So what we need actually is a way <coughs> to find a unique signature. And for this, we need to, to consider um, cosmic evolution and development that has generated, you might say, a new world each time from the physical to the material, biological and technological. And, and they are distinguishable in the sense that at each uh, transition, at, at, at each level of uh, emergence, there are new properties that appear that were not at the previous level. So I think there is serious hope to, to find uh, a unique biosignature in the biological world or a techno signature in the technological world. But so history of science uh, tell us that, that the discovery of extraterrestrials will be a major paradigm shift. And I think here it's appropriate to, to use this word. And, and previous um, radical shifts took decades to be accepted. If you look at the Copernican revolution, it was not uh, when Copernic uh, brought his model that it was accepted immediately. You have two competing models and both of uh, their worth. And in the case of the search for extraterrestrials, I, I suspect it will be a similar story that we will have uh, two, two foundational hypotheses, either a natural physical hypothesis to, exp to explain a manifestation, uh, a phenomena, or an artificial hypothesis. And both will have uh, some undesirable effects, things that, for example, things they, they can't explain, and desirable effects, uh, such as validated predictions, uh, explanations, and they might be in conflict also on, on offering different explanations. So uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, the, the discovery um, won't be, uh, is likely to be slow and, and difficult, and won't be a clear-cut signal that, that everybody agrees upon. And uh, I think it was Philip Morrison who, who said that uh, the discovery of extraterrestrials would be more like the discovery of agriculture and not like the discovery of America. So let's move into uh, universal constraints to, to try to find life. So how old um, could extraterrestrials be? And so there is a, a study by Line Weaver and collaborators that, that shows that on average, extraterrestrials are likely to be about 2 billion years older than us. And, and for the simple reason that, um, um, that our, our, our sun, our star is rather young. And so if life started on, on a, uh, around a, a solar um, type of, of star and on a rocky planet, then it means that other extraterrestrials have, uh, on average, about two billion years uh, a head start. So that's absolutely huge. And um, also there is another argument that, um, that shows that we should long, look for old and long lasting uh, civilizations. It's simply that there would be uh, the, the most detectable because, because of the structure of space time, because of the great distances and the finite, finiteness of the speed of light, we would be most likely to, to, to find um, a long lasting signal and thus uh, civilization. So how do we find a, a long lasting and very old, very advanced uh, civilization? Um, we need to extrapolate. So is it good or bad? Let's see, to extrapolate or not to extrapolate? That is the question. So if we don't extrapolate much our own um, development of civilization to try to find extraterrestrials, it has a big advantage that there, there will be very low ambiguity of, on what we search for. It will, we'll have very specific uh, signatures that we'll be able to search for. The disadvantage is that it will be totally unrealistic as uh, Dyson 
uh, but it <clears throat> but still proceed with uh, with this distribution and and also more worrying is that if we see the, the pace at which technological progress is going and accelerating this provides um, um, with a low extrapolation of our technology we have actually a, a short window of uh, opportunity and so we are back with the, the same problem as with a traditional radio that, that is, has also a short window of uh, observability detectability so on the other hand if we uh, make high extrapolations if we speculate on how extraterrestrial would be in the far future it fits with the idea that uh, the ETIs we would detect would be old. It offers a larger window. But of course, the big disadvantage is that we need to envision to speculate what they, they could be like. And so how do we um, extrapolate? Well, as carefully as possible, we need to work on eggs and be very very careful not to make too many assumptions and to to have a very firm ground so what we need are, are to i think what's most sensible is to rely on the most general principles from from physics the universality of physical laws that would constrain uh, any extraterrestrial life the universality of energetics and far from equilibrium thermodynamics so the universality, so this derives from the universality of needing to, to use energy. And I would say also from the university of, uh, sorry, universality of life um, and uh, a theoretical biological framework um, is, is necessary. And uh, I, will, I will speak about uh, living system theory uh, a bit later. So what is life? Um, I'm not going to claim to have a definite definition here. It's a very tricky subject matter. There are hundreds of definitions, but there is one necessary condition that um, most definitions agree upon. It's metabolism. And here it's a quote from uh, the great uh, Robert Freitas, who wrote uh, Xenology, uh, a great, re a great uh, book about SETI that I warmly recommend to everyone. And in it, he writes that life requires metabolism, a systematic manipulation of matter, energy, and information. But manipulation can only be accomplished by the application of force. So here is a twist. By which force? What are the forces of the universe? Well, we know the answer to this. There are four fundamental forces. So it means there are four fundamental uh, kinds of living things that, that the universe could make. The first that we know is electromagnetism. If you think about our biology, it's all based on, on, on electromagnetism or on, on electrical potential that, that uh, structure or, or, or living um, makeup. And even if we would create robots and a kind of uh, silicon-based life, uh, it would still be based on electromagnetism. So it could still be um, a not so exotic kind of life, I would say. Another option is to have a metabolism that uses strong nuclear force to manipulate matter, energy, and information. Mm, maybe this kind of uh, state where, where the strong nuclear force has a as a potential to organize things could be in white dwarfs or, or neutron stars, uh, so extremely compact states of matter. The weak nuclear force, um, it's a bit less promising, but maybe it's a, a failure of my imagination here. Um, and gravitation is also a possibility, but it's a very weak force, so probably um, a life form based on, on gravity would uh, we need uh, to, to make the most of, um, of an extremely dense state of matter uh, such as a, a black hole. So another very general way to, to think about life is simply to see it 
as a network of reaction. So what is life as we know it? It's a network of reactions. It's a network of chemical reactions. And what would be nuclear life? Well, it's a network of reactions. It's also a network of reactions such as A plus B gives C plus D, and then they are combined, they form autocatalytic auto sets, uh, organizations, hierarchies, control, etc., etc., etc. But in principle, uh, here the difference is just the the basic um, the basic reactions uh, that, that combine elements. And is one is chemical reactions, the other is nuclear reactions. So now uh, I would like to, to remind you, well, you, you know this very well, I guess, but the Kardashev scale. But uh, I here it's uh, presented as a, um, as a phase transition, really, that uh, humanity has been consuming exponentially more and more energy, uh, so very quickly. So it means that if we continue at this rate, we would very quickly become a uh, type two civilization able to, to use uh, the whole output of, of the sun. So it means in practice that in our searches, we are likely to find either a primitive biosphere or a stellar civilization, but nothing. So, um, an analogy I can give is that, imagine that you, you prepare ice cubes, you put them in the freezer, and you ask a friend to guess uh, what's the state of, of uh, my ice, ice cubes. And most likely you would say, uh, well, it's, it's, it's still water or it's ice. But who would say, well, it's a kind of ice with a uh, self-organizing crystals in between that is uh, that is in, in between water and ice that's extremely unlikely so more on the on the stellar um, civilization id we actually use about 10 to 13 watts of the of power on Earth, and we receive actually 10, about 10 to 17 watts on Earth, so the, the raw solar energy. And if you look at the number, it's actually ridiculous. It means that nearly the whole solar output is wasted. The whole solar output is about four times 10 to 26 watts. So this number, this amount of energy we receive on Earth is ridiculous. And to make this point very clear, um, if we would use the whole solar output, we could sustain 3,000 billion Earth civilizations. 3,000 billion. So, um, well, actually, I thought uh, about it in an even ethical way, with a, with a very um, subset of ethics, uh, not well known, which is called thermoethics and which says that you should make the, the most of free energy and not waste it. And um, so that would be an argument that if extraterrestrials also grow morally and ethically, they wouldn't, less, they wouldn't uh, let this free energy to be wasted and use it to, to, to do work, interesting work and construct complexity. So, here is another universal constraint, which is uh, the Barrow scale. And it's the idea that um, it's a bit, it was a bit constructed as a reaction against the Kardashev scale of more and more and more energy use. But in the other way, uh, somehow, so looking at the scale that, um, that uh, civilization is capable of manipulating. So we start with tools of our own scale, such as a, a hammer, a shovel, and then we developed micro technologies. Uh, we are entering uh, bio, biotechnologies and nanotechnologies, so 10 to mi minus nine meters. But uh, if, you, if you look at this uh, perspective, 
as uh, Richard Feynman said famously, there is plenty of room at the bottom also for our technology to develop. So you probably even never heard those potential new technologies that, that will appear in the future. Pico technology, femto technology, ato technology, zepto technology, yocto technology, wokto technology, wokto technology, and finally Planck technology, which will be a civilization able to manipulate the structure of space-time itself. <coughs> So uh, here I would like to make the, the point that the, both the Kardashev and the Barrow scales are extremely um, pure in terms of assumptions. They use only the very universal concepts of energy for Kardashev scale and, and scale for, for the Barrow scale. So we are not making any assumption of motivations, uh, what kind of technologies they could build, what they would do with their energy. So it's very clean conceptual. So another um, way somehow that combines uh, the Kardashev and the Barrow scale to, to search for extraterrestrials is the energy rate density, um, which has been defined as a, as a complexity metric by uh, Eric Chasson. And it's defined as, as the rate at which free energy transits in a complex system of a given mass. So it's not only uh, that a, a complex system would not just have a lot of energy, but it would have to be relatively small compared to the flow of energy that it can manage or sustain without, without dying. So the units are in erg per second, which is an energy flow, and normalized by, by, the, by the mass. So I want to give you some orders of magnitudes here. Um, for example, a protostar has a value of 0 0.5 on this energy rate density uh, scale. A main sequence star, a value of two, a red giant, a, a value of 100. In the living uh, realm, uh, plants have uh, values between 100 and 1000. Reptiles um, 10 to the fourth and mammals five times 10 to the fourth. So basically keep in mind that living things are, are on, the, uh, on the range of 10 to the fourth. <coughs> so Chasson also used um, his metric to analyze societies. And he showed that the energy use of hunter gatherers is about 10 to the fourth of uh, agriculturists, 10 to the fifth, and industrialists also, uh, five times 10 to the fifth. So to summarize this, uh, this part, uh, what should we be looking for? Old extraterrestrials, big, that's uh, a constraint also that Dyson gave, it's just an observational constraint. There might be very small, uh, Pico, Pico technology around, um, but we wouldn't be able to, to observe them today at least. High energy, that's the Kardashev argument. Compact, that's the Barrow scale. And complex, that's the uh, Chasson uh, universal metric. That is uh, used by uh, actually uh, uh, big history, in big history and uh, in cosmic evolution to, to give a, a general red line of, of the, this whole uh, story that we are all part of. But this also, these constraints also imply things that we should not look for necessarily. First is communication. Indeed, uh, as much as we don't try to communicate with bacteria that are around us, a uh, civilization that is two billion years ahead of us wouldn't uh, care communicating with us not necessarily a planet, because we, we saw that uh, the, there is actually a kind of, uh, let's say a planet with intelligent life, that um, if we want to, to find advanced life, it's more likely to be in relation to, to, to stars, anomalies in, in, in stars or, or modifications of stars. And also not necessarily the, the what you hear are the, the basic building blocks of life, such as 
oxygen, water, carbon, uh, sun-like star, earth, earth temperatures. Uh, and all these uh, assumptions were already criticized by Carl Sagan in uh, the 1970s. So what are the most complex things beyond Earth? Well, I did some calculations on uh, binary star systems in accretion. And what I found is that they are anomalous, anomalously high on the, the energy rate density metric of uh, Chesson. So white dwarfs are about 10 to the fourth and neutron stars and black holes 10 to the sixth. So this is absolutely huge for um, apparently non-living systems. Well, there are other systems in, in, in the universe that have high values, such as uh, supernova, which have also a value of around 10 to the sixth. Um, but uh, arguably supernovas are very short, unstable and destructive. So uh, it, it doesn't really look like life. So let's turn to um, trying to assess the Stellivore civilization ID. So the Stellivore ID is actually a reinterpretation of known um, existing binary star systems where you have one dense uh, body which can be a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole that uh, accretes from uh, a companion star. And uh, there are jets that are ejected out of the system in the case of neutron stars and black holes, or novas in the, in the case of uh, white dwarfs are explosions that eject matter out of the gravitational bound of the system. So the study of our interpretation simply says that the companion star is a, the, an energy source. The jets or novas that eject matter out of the system is the entropy or waste products. And the big question is whether the, the compact object is a, is a study or is an advanced civilization. And yes, I, I should add also that uh, the accretion process turns itself on and off. So it's not just a constant flux of, uh, of matter that is directed from the companion star to, to the dense body. Um, and, um, and this is also an indication that there could be a, a budgeting of, of energy, which is also a fundamental aspect of living systems that they control, um, they control how much energy they, they take. So our living, ah, sorry, our study of living systems. So here I, um, I, I, I show the 20 living subsystems proposed by uh, James Greer Miller. Um, and so you see that the, the reproducer function uses matter, energy, and information. There are 10 subsystems that use matter, energy, and 10 subsystems that manipulate information. And in a way, it's a, it's a very smart move from a traditional SETI to, to, to look for just a, a signal out there, which in, li in living system theory, it's uh, the output transducer number 19 here, because just from this subsystem of information, you would, you would be able to infer all the rest that all the, the rest were, was living. But on the other hand, it's, it's also limiting because it's ignoring the matter energy uh, aspects. So when I first started to, to look at uh, binary star systems, I thought, well, this looks like a metabolism. You have a boundary, the, the white dwarf neutron star or black hole, an ingestor, there is a way uh, by which the energy is channeled from, from the companion star to the dense body. And there is a, an extru extruder function. So that's basically the function of putting out waste products and entropy outside the system. Um, 
And uh, recently I looked a, a bit closer uh, to this and, and there are actually other um, living systems that, that um, living subsystem that seem to, to fit with, a, with, a, with binary star systems in accretion being potentially alive. For example, um, convert a uh, converter function. So what's ejected from the system, at least in some white dwarf systems, are heavier elements than what it's accreted from the companion star. So it means it's not just the energy from the companion star that, that circles are, are around the, the white dwarf and, and then ejects. It's, there has been a transformation. There has been a transformation of matter. There are heavier, heavier elements that are ejected than, than one, what, it, what it ingests, what it uh, accretes. Also, uh, you could see other elements such as uh, the matter energy storage, which could be simply the accretion disk that, that stores the, the plasma before being uh, ingested. And and the motor function could be also uh, um, displayed as we know that some binary star systems are actually um, moving throughout the galaxy. Um, yeah, sorry. But so you might object that yes, in this interpretation, if we, even if we grant that uh, there are some matter energy processes that are a bit suspicious, we still don't really have a a proof of life or an indication of, of a living thing because uh, life has to do with information and information is fundamental to life. And it's true. Um, and possibly also because information tend to be more internal to, to a system, um, except maybe for, for the timer subsystem. So number 20 here, the last one, um, which could be a pulsar positioning system. So what is a, a pulsar position, the pulsar positioning system? Well, it's a set of uh, X-ray millisecond pulsars that provide the equivalent of a galactic GPS accurate down 200 meters. Well, accurate down 200 meters. So you, it means that all civilizations in, in the galaxy can navigate the galaxy uh, with an accuracy down to 100 meters. Is this magic after all? What do you think? Um, so I don't believe in magic. So I wrote a, a paper to, to try to assess this idea. And I proposed um, <coughs> lines of inquiry that would, um, that would possibly uh, make some progress on, on this question. The first would be to look at the spatial and power distribution of uh, X-ray millisecond pulsars in the galaxy. If it's a kind of engineered um, uh, global uh, well, galactic positioning system, then the, 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 the spatial distribution should be kind of optimal for, for navigation. Uh, the population also should be optimal. There should be just the right number of uh, X-ray millisecond pulsars for, for navigation. Their evolutionary tracks should be uh, different than the ones from uh, astrophysical models. So it means that there should be uh, gaps or, or, or problems in, a, in a regular astrophysical um, models, if, if indeed they are, they are modified by advanced extraterrestrials. Another thing we could look for, though it's a very long uh, time scale pro uh, project, is to, to try to find a synchronization between pulsars. So that stems from the analogy with a GPS, where you need to synchronize uh, uh, from time to time the, the satellites with a, with a control segment that is a segment that is on Earth, so that to make sure that the time is really the same for all the uh, GPS satellites. Um, this one is a bit weaker, but we would also expect that uh, the pulsar positioning system would work near the, the speed of light. So this shouldn't be uh, too hard actually to, to test. Um, we should also um, generally be, be able to 
to decode uh, galactic coordinates that could be um, embedded in, uh, in various directed panspermia or, or artifacts that would be sent on Earth. So that personally would be the first thing I would do if I would find a, a supposedly alien artifact is to look for the coordinates of Earth in, a, in, a, the, in the somewhere encoded in the artifact much as uh, the, the famous golden record did include uh, the position of, uh, of Earth uh, on, the, on the mission. And um, and of course there could be more information in uh, if the pulsars have been modified in the pulsars uh, pulses that are still to be um, Decoded. And the interesting thing also is that the um, directed panspermia um, ID or, or, or even looking for metadata encoded by, by pulsars uh, also holds if, if we are not as speculative and, uh, and just say, and just assume that, um, that this is very useful to, to navigate and to, um, and, and so, um, and so we can assume that uh, also for, for SETI it's very constraining because the, the first thing we might be able to decode actually timing and navigation or coordinates uh, in, in a message. Um, and, and why? Because, because uh, this is a kind of metadata and metadata is generally not uh, encrypted. So we have much more chances to to decode uh, a metadata of a message that is encoded via X-ray millisecond pulsars than um, uh, the, the actual content of a message. So could it be a kind of uh, cosmic gorilla effect? Um, De La Torre and Garcia um, showed that um, we humans are, are subject to inattentional blindness. If we, if we look for something and we find something else, so to summarize, um, I, I want to, to show the axis of merit of steady verse. Of course, it's, um, uh, it's a bit subjective. It's my assessment, so it would be the, the best possible uh, case, let's say, for the, the, <laughs> the steady verse ID. So this axis of merit were developed at the Techno Signatures workshop um, uh, of, uh, of NASA organized in 2000. 18. And so on the left, you have a lower merit, and on the right of each axis, you have a higher merit. So in the case of steady rows, the observing capabilities is uh, to the maximum because the, we have already observed um, binary star systems in accretion. The cost is extremely cheap. We already have the, the data in, in papers and databases. There are many. Um, ancillary benefits because uh, it could be a new way to, even if it fails, it could be a new way to, to, to look at binary star systems and, and find maybe new features, new models. And it's also a good case to, to try to, to assess whether we deal with extraterrestrials or not, because it's a, it's a concrete hypothesis that is in, in the data. Uh, the detectability is more than detectable, actually it's detected. The duration is extremely long-lived. Binary star systems are at least compact um, objects, such as white dwarf neutron stars and black holes are uh, the, the most long-lived objects in, in the universe. The ambiguity, uh, subjectively, I would put it in the middle. Uh, for me, the biggest question is whether we are dealing with a dissipative system that is just channeling some energy in, in some ways or whether it's really a living system. The extrapolation is extremely high from our current technology, but I show that we have to, to extrapolate if we are serious about finding a very advanced extraterrestrials. The inevitability, uh, 
And again, this is quite subjective, but I think it's quite inevitable that an advanced civilization would not waste the, the energy of its home star. And the information, it's rather information poor because uh, there is just one information subsystem out of the 20 subsystems of uh, Miller's that is um, displayed, which is uh, the, the timing via millisecond pulsars. So to summarize you now more specifically to, with the, the, the merits of the pulsar positioning system ID, uh, it's similar, we know that it exists. Um, it's very long lived, the um, neutron stars are extremely long lived. It's quite unambiguous, at least in its functionality. Uh, NASA has already tested successfully uh, the, the pulsar positioning system and determined the, the location of the International Space Station with um, not 100 meters accuracy, but a few kilometers accuracy. And it will come in the future, I guess. Um, the extrapolation, well, depends how you look at it, but if we look at uh, the extrapolation of thinking about a uh, navigation system on Earth and navigation system on the galaxy, well, it's not such a big extrapolation after all. It's just that we want um, uh, a way to coordinate actions and time uh, on, on the galaxy as much as, a, as a, the GPS was a revolution for, for planet Earth. The in inevitability, I think um, we can make a case that it's quite inevitable to develop a kind of uh, a coordination mechanism or a, a timing subsystem in, in living um, system theory just to to have a common standard of, uh, of time and space, which is essential to coordinate activities. And uh, the information is rather, uh, should be, yeah, probably should be more to the left. It's rather poor. I mean, timing information is a very basic kind of uh, information. So yes, that's a, that's a, big, uh, a big shortcoming. So to conclude, where is everybody uh, behind the screen of assumptions? So don't forget, don't ever forget this. Know them at least, make them explicit and challenge them. Look for long-lived high energy techno signatures and most probably um, tied to stellar civilizations. I think that's what they are likely to find. The Stellivor ID has many living systems uh, features. It has an anomalously high energy rate density complexity, and it's a, a concrete technosignature candidate to, to assess with existing data. The pulsar positioning system is an impressive 100 meters accuracy kind of galactic GPS. Uh, could it be a kind of uh, cosmic gorilla effect? Uh, anyway, even if there is no engineering, no, no crazy uh, steady world out there, uh, millisecond pulsars are, are still a natural um, way to encode metadata communication for, um, for com any potential communication in the galaxy or for any navigation of uh, artifacts or, or any directed panspermia um, programs that would be run by, by extraterrestrials. I uh, thank you for your attention. And if something is wrong, please tell me what. And uh, can these ideas be further tested? If yes, please tell me how. Now in the comments or by email. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, I just wanted to comment on your excellent graphics. I was really impressed. It's not me. <laughs> really, really nice. Um, we have uh, about seven minutes until the hour. Um, and I see there's some comments in the uh, chat from Abel Mendez. If you want to unmute and ask your questions, otherwise I'd be happy to read them aloud here. So. Uh, yes, please, please do start with one if I may unmute. Okay, so Abel says, maybe as this is a comment from earlier in your talk, um, 
uh, he says it might be better to say that life is a chemical reaction of the form A plus B uh, yields 2A plus C. A copy of the original example is DNA is created from some environment B and creating some waste C. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I mean, I was not trying to, to make something uh, accurate uh, biochemically or even thermodynamically here, but uh, I mean, there are tons of, um, of possibilities of uh, chemical reactions um, that are, and, and to go to the topic of the possibility of nuclear life, I think it would be a very interesting topic to explore, uh, at least formally, the, the the set of what nuclear reactions could do together if they could create some kind of autocatalysis, some kind of um, organization, some kind of, of more complexity, because uh, in a way we associate the nuclear with just very simple things, uh, which are uh, energy and bombs. And so we, we are not really a, a civilization that control the, the atom in the sense that we could build any kind of tool with, uh, with atoms. We are, we are just cheating a little bit here with, <laughs> with atomic energy and atomic bombs. Um, and a question um, in the chat again from Abel says, what would be the axis of merit of FRB's fast radio bursts compared to the cellivores and PPS. Remind me what PPS stands for again. Uh, pulsar positioning system. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, I don't know, I would need to make the exercise, but um, a priori, I don't see many living uh, features of uh, uh, FR FRBs. So, or neither a kind of nice uh, navigation system or timing system. So uh, I would rate uh, FRBs rather low, uh, although, yeah, there are still mysteries uh, surrounding them. So it still could be very interesting. And, and uh, of course, it needs to be followed up very, very closely. But uh, yeah. Um, we have another comment from, oh, there are hands up. I've been missing this. One second. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute. Um, the first one I see here is Jason, right? Hi, come on. Um, I too wanna to compliment you on your really nice graphics. Those, those really help and were very clear. Um, I hope, one thing that's puzzled me about the cellivore hypothesis is, um, what you mean by a living system, because you argued persuasively that technology on the Barlow scale can give high energy rate densities. Um, but I don't see why a living system would necessarily have a high energy rate density. And so I sort of see the argument for how these, um, these binary systems might be very useful engines or machines of some sort, perhaps have been artificially created to give you those high densities. But I'm missing the connection to calling them living systems. Are you saying that they are literally alive? And if so, what's the rationale? Yes, sure. Um, so, well, first, um, from, a, from a kind of a blind trust to the energy rate density metric of, of Chesson, um, if it's, there, there are only living things that have a high energy rate density. So, this is already very suspicious. This should uh, this should tell that that it's uh, that it's uh, alive directly. But um, but um, yes. So what what makes me think is that, that they are alive? Actually, it's a, it's a kind of um, uh, ma macroscopic meta metabolism that uh, that I see in some binary star systems. So you have energy use, so in energy ingestion from the companion star, and, and that is somehow transformed and some ejection of, uh, of, of products that look like waste. Um, and uh, yes, and well, I, I don't exclude the, the possibilities that um, uh, what I call the, the power plant uh, possibility in my, in my paper about it, 
is that uh, actually just this, um, these binary star systems are really the, the greatest energy gradients in, in the universe. So an advanced civilization might just be able to, to go there and construct uh, the equivalent of uh, hydroelectric dams and, and manage this energy flow and use it for, for their purposes. Uh, that's uh, certainly a, a possibility. So that they wouldn't be the, the whole system, but they would just uh, tweak this binary star systems for their energy hungry uh, purposes. Um, another possibility uh, would be the, the, that there is a kind of development that um, um, once uh, a planet has a, has a kind of uh, is a kind of entity on its own, like we are creating a kind of global entity, global awareness today. Uh, it will want at a certain point to, to grow even more, to, to complexify, and then starts maybe to get closer to its star, and then at a certain point get want to get even more energy, and then start a, a kind of accretion process. All right, we have it. We're at the hour, so if you have to leave, you feel free to. Um, but I want to get this last question in before we end. Um, go ahead, Scott, unmute. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, really a nice talk. And I had a question about uh, the Stellabor hypothesis, which is quite related to what Jason asked as well. Um, you mentioned that it's a, that these binary systems are long lasting and that's totally true. The, but uh, during the active accretion phase, um, it could be only tens or hundreds of millions or maybe a, a small number of billions of years when, when they're in the active accretion phase. And so this is, I think, how it's kind of related to Jason's question is, you know, what if it's a living system in itself, to me, that seems like it's a short lived system. But if it's used as a tool, would, would that mean that the civilizations that which are actively using these as, as energy providing machines, would they switch binary systems when another one starts going into active accretion? Um, do you have thoughts on that? Yes, I do. Um, and actually, I think it would be a, a very nice way to, to, to make a prediction, a concrete prediction that would possibly uh, be a proof. And w one prediction would be that you, you take a, a binary star system that has almost exhausted its, its companion star, and you look what happens. And if it's really alive, it's energy seeking. So it means that somehow it will try to, to get a kick uh, or to, to move and move not in a random direction, but towards uh, the nearest star, preferably a single star to avoid any conflict. Um, and so if you see, um, yeah, if you would see a, a, a rogue, uh, I mean, one way to really test this would be to, to look at, um, uh, at at a white dwarf neutron star or black hole that has finished or almost finished to, to consume its star and to see if it's going somewhere. And the, under the study of our hypothesis, you could, uh, you could predict that it would go not in a random direction, but towards the, the nearest star, just, just because it's seeking a new star to, to, to get energy from. Globular clusters might be a great place for them to live in. That'd be great. Yes, yes, I'm intrigued of this. I know you're an expert on that. Yeah. All right, so uh, uh, I think we have to, unfortunately, uh, end mainly because I have another meeting that started three minutes ago. But yes, the um, this will be re this is recorded and will be posted on uh, YouTube, and I will send out the link to the IAA SETI uh, listserv as soon as that's ready. But I want to say thank you so much to our speaker. That was a a, a rich talk, and um, I hope everyone is is hanging in there and, and staying safe. And um, We'll see everyone in about a month. And I'll send out more information. So thanks everyone. And I'll see you around. Thank you, Lina. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.